Tino with music you can see. I just ran into a singer-songwriter, actually a local talent, uh, Michael. Michael Ubaldini. Ubaldini. Yeah, it's God. tough. It's a tough one. Tongue twister. <laughs> but today's actually a special day because you have a new album that just dropped today. Right. It just came out, Rabbit Foot Carnival, and I'm excited about it because um, it's my first one with my with a band. My band since um, 2016. I had a record, Star Shaker, and um, the Ballad of Brian Jones was an EP on vinyl, limited vinyl and stuff. So I'm, you know, been doing a lot of folk stuff, you know, so I'm excited to do this now and get this album out. And your career started with Mystery Train? Actually, it started earlier, like in the early punk days with the band called the Earwigs from uh, Orange County. We used to play um, the Cuckoo's Nest and all these, those clubs you probably remember. Yeah, the Dollhead. Yeah, the Dollhead. And this is, this is even before the Dollhead, right? The, gold, the Golden Bear. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the Golden Bear. And then, um, so it started there and we had one single out we made an album that never, um, it never saw the light of day. It was going to come out. I think I can't remember what little label was going to stick it out, and then they folded, like they did in those days. And then, uh, so now it's kind of a cult thing. Like I guess when it was played on radio, people used to record it on cassettes, like off of Rodney on the Rock. And you got you got K Rock. Right. And yeah. And so the, back when KNAC was pre-metal, it was uh, this. There was a DJ named Sue Mink. And it, yeah. And so um. They used to play it, they were playing it off cassettes and then the album never came out. So all these years later, sort of a cult following around it and we put out one single and it goes, it, it, it blows me away because it goes for like three or 400 bucks on eBay. Wow. Yeah, crazy, right? Wow. So, I, cool. so I'm thinking about like reissuing that album or I mean, it'll actually be a first release, right? right? Because it was never, it never really actually released. got issued, yeah. Nice. So it's like well, a real life Eddie and the Cruisers or something, right? Right, <laughs> right. and you know, now you can do it so much as your, as an artist. You yeah. don't have you can get your own distribution through a distro kit or a tune core right. CD baby. Yeah, yeah. You control all that now. Right, distro kit's great. I love that. Yeah. You know it is. It's just like a one place. Even yeah. if you do a cover song, they'll, they'll, they'll you know they'll, they'll yeah they get the rights together. Yeah, for they get the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you do an old folk tune. They know who wrote it. Absolutely. So yeah, you kid growing up Fountain Valley. Yeah. Your dad's playing you Hank Williams. Right. You're yeah. listening to uh, Ray Charles. Yeah. Just some Tell really me what good I'd stuff. say. Yeah, when I was about, I, when I was a small kid, I, I was, my first memory is um, that Meet the Beatles record my sisters had. So this is like before even like kindergarten or something. And so I was just, in a weird way, I always kind of knew I wanted to do music. Like I, I just thought that was what I was supposed to do. And then my dad was uh, kind of a hobbyist on guitar and he liked Hank Williams and uh, Ray Charles and people like that. And he goes, oh, hey, let me show you some songs. I'll show you, chords are easy, you know because he just kind of knocked around on it. But then I got really got into that. I love Hank Williams and Ray Charles. And I started, even as a child, I started to get into rootsy type of music. I guess even though it wasn't as rootsy as it would be now, right. you know, right. it's only a decade earlier, right? The Rolling Stones and Creedence Clearwater Revival. I remember them when I was a little boy. My sister had those records, so I, I dug all that, you know. And then just traveled backwards and got into the blues and all that kind of thing, gospel music, yeah. Yeah, this new album you got gospel like backups. Yeah. Talk about that. Like, yeah, I, I um, well, I like a lot of um early early gospel pre-war, um, I guess pro Second World War, all those old field recordings and and just coming out of the church those old sermons, and so that was a big influence. So I I just like that sound, and then of course I like um, you know old rock and roll and country music and things like that and blues. So I just thought, well, I'm gonna mix, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do some of these gospel tunes. And get them on there. You know, obviously, God blessed you with talent, and He blessed you to keep you around. Right. What does the future look like? So you've got you're gonna go tour with this album. What do you? Find? Yeah, yeah. So um, this album, it's it's done. I'm excited about it. So I've got a a great band. I have Bob Haig from the he used to play in the band Sparks and Bates, Bates Motel was another group he was Absolutely. in. Absolutely. I think they had that song. What are you ready for the Sex Girls yeah. or something? Yeah. Are you ready for this? Yeah. It was so, used in a, one of the '80s movies. Right. Right. So um, and he's a he's a he's a, a rock and roller and roots guy, which you wouldn't know. Because Sparks was a great band, but they were in a different area, right? So, so, um, so it's great. And then a, a girl named Julie Harris sang the backup on it, and the whole band's real good. It's a real band, so, so it's not like a bunch of people in ten bands or anything like that. A little pedal steel on there on some songs. Yeah, and I always liked um, 
you know the band remember the group the band oh, yeah and bob bob dylan when he was playing with them like planet waves i always loved that stuff wow so it's just kind of like trying to do your own thing but, but using all those different drawing from all those influences i just love to do what i i just think that all the music is a great thing to tap into you know whether it's like gospel music or I don't know, early punk music or blues or whatever. You know, it's all valid, you know. And it seems like you've gone the gamut from punk all the way yeah. to, like, you know. Right, that's right. Americana, Americana, Americana. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, because even when I was with Mystery Train, which um, Lee Rocker had produced that album. And you were on a early, major label. Yeah, EMI. Yeah. And, wow. like, um, that was in the early 90s. And that was kind of, we were a little bit ahead of that alt-country um, when they, before they started using Americana as a marketing right, label. Right, right. So we were kind of, like, in the grunge period doing that you know so um but that was um great and, and brian sets already played it on a track with me brian played wow. yeah yeah he just came in there like just pour me a glass of whiskey and then he played a solo wow. we, we did a, a, two solos honor. yeah it was really cool wow yeah very cool lots of fun gosh michael this has been a pleasure you know you're the only one we've met at nam that actually has an album that dropped today so that's great that's you really know cool. congratulations on that it's really